what you do find why I like March that much is because the, all of a sudden your hatches are a lot more consistent. Um, you get a lot of termite stroke ants, but there are about five or six different types of ants that are available. And the fish get very selective and often get very really picky. And I think this is where a lot of people really struggle because they're using the same flies they have in the past, the hoppers and the beetles. And the fish are, are, are literally ignoring those flies. Yeah, and I'm sure a lot of the members have experienced that. And a lot of others don't really, haven't really identified what's happening. Um, you know, they don't see the refusals. They don't see the fish coming up within millimeters of the fly and then refusing it. Not once, two, three, four times. And human nature is a strange thing. We're often very reluctant to change flies. You know, I think we'll just keep bashing away with a beetle or something like that in the hope that the fish is going to eat it. You've got to change tack and you've got to adapt accordingly. And I think that's where people don't, you know, don't make that change. But there's another thing that's important. It, it, the, what, the, what I call observation. Stop for 10, 15 minutes. What are the fish doing? Have I found some fish? Am I in an area where there are some fish? What, how, do I know what the fish are doing? Have I identified the rise forms? Uh, those are crucial things. So lots of people see these splashy rises and there's one to the left they throw there. There's another one to the right they cast there. And, and fundamentally, you're really wasting your time. You're looking for fish that are either eating something on the surface or they're eating something subsurface, which we'll discuss just now. And maybe you can ask some questions. Always helps me and makes my life a little easier. So there are lots of those little subtle things that become very important. And a lot of people are waiting for you to hand them what I call the silver bullet. They want you, they want you to put something in their hand and say, this is the solution to stack contained. Right there, you have all the answers. The truth is, there's no such thing. But I can tell you that casting plays a huge role at Stirkfontein. And not just at Stirkfontein. Wherever you go, it's going to be um, crucially important. But more so at Stirkfontein because you've got to deliver that fly. There are lots of things happening. You've got to see, you've got to see the fish on the surface. If the sun's right, so now you've got to work out which way he's going. And you've got to lead that fish by a meter or two. Um, and you can't throw the fly at him because if it lands, plops on his head, that fish is out of there. And the majority of people are not prepared to really work on their casting. They accept their casting as being just it is what it is, but it becomes a very, very big limiting factor. And it's not about 30 meters. It's about casting accurately and quickly, not five, six, seven, eight false casts. You need to get there. In one or two false casts, your fly needs to be there. You need to turn the fly over. All those sort of things become really important. Um, but identifying what the fish are doing, also very important. Having the right flies, crucially important, okay? Um, and we're gonna talk about tippets and we're gonna talk a little bit about nylon and all those things, which a lot of people, so Africans are a strange bunch. You know, they always blame, if you haven't got fluorocarbon, you're just not in the game at, at, at Stirkfontein. Well, I've got some bad news for you because some good friends of mine have been fishing with six, eight, 10, and 12 pound maximum and catch good fish on those. But you've got to qualify very carefully when the fish, when the water's crystal clear and flat, calm, and you're down to an 18 or 20, you need to be fishing 5x or 6x. And you can't give it the marlin heave ho because you're going to break the nylon off every time. So the, the, those are lots of the little subtle variables which we can discuss and, and I'll go through with you carefully. Um, and the other thing is, I'm a firm believer that a good guide will teach you in a day what has taken him nearly 30 years to put together. He will show you things and say, okay, you see the fish just head and tailing, he's eating something in the, in the surface film, as my good Afrikaans mate used to say, in the surface film, because you don't see the telltale bubble. But if there's something on the surface, fish has to come up, go down, he'll leave the bubble. Okay, now the fish is eating something on the surface. It could be a mayfly type thing, but we've we've established that already. When you see the head and tail is eating more than likely a midge or corona, but that's stuck in the surface film, then you're at a clink hammer type parachute type scenario. So those are little subtle things, okay? And look around. Often you won't find anything, but often you'll find a small little ant in the water. Have a look at it, take a photograph, okay? Um, and get the right flies. Unfortunately, the majority of commercially available flies in South Africa leave 
much to be desired. And I think that's that's the polite description. So you need to have the right flies. It's one thing having the right flies. It's quite another setting it up and making sure you're confident. But that's where the casting comes into it. And we're going to talk a little bit about leaders. For me, when the, when the fishing's really tough, you need to be fishing leader and tippet combination minimum 15 foot, call it five meters. Um, more if you can do it, 18 to 20 foot. This is where this is where your casting skills come into it. I think one needs to qualify very carefully. It's much easier from a boat. You're standing on an elevated thing. When you're fishing from the shore on an incline or something like that, it's a lot more difficult. If there's a chop on the surface, you can get away with bigger flies and, and heavier nylon. If it's flat, calm, those fish are going to be scrutinizing your flies um, so much more. Okay, But you had such an advantage. If you can see the fish moving, what you've got to say to yourself, okay, the fish is moving, it's eating something in the film, have I got the right flower? And do I know which way he's going? Okay, they do change direction. They don't, but often they'll move in a straight line. That's where the casting is. One, two false cast, the fly's got to be down. So those are some of the, the, the crucial components um, of it. And I can't stress enough, you've got to get, for those who are struggling with their casting, get a lesson, not from your family butcher or dentist, from someone who knows you know, who can teach you in a language you can follow. Why this? Why that? Why am I not getting a tight loop? Why am I struggling? Why am I not getting a little bit of extra distance? And I think people put too much emphasis on distance. Accuracy often far outweighs distance. Being able to cast further than most is an advantage. There are times when the fish won't come close to the, the, the boat or the shore, and you've got to now make a longer cast. And you've got to make it with fewer false casts. I, I, I noticed and I learned a lot at the back end of the season. There were days when I could see really big fish in the water. And I had 5X, 6X, and I had a size 18, 20, and the fish were still refusing me. But they were so twitchy. When I picked the rod up to make a back cast, I could see the fish, bang, gone. So those are those, those steep learning curves. And I mean, I've always said about fly fishing, the beauty about fly fishing is you never stop learning. You'll spend a lifetime and more learning all the time. I learned a lot this season. I learned from other fly fishers and just observation, paying attention to what's on the water. And, and you know, some people think you go out and you just find fish automatically. It doesn't happen like that. There are days when it does and it's nice, but the, you can always, if you've got a plan B, C and D, and as a guide, you've got to have that plan B, C and D. If my plan A doesn't work, I've got to look at the conditions. I've got to look at where we are in the season. I've got to look at how much wind is blowing, what direction the wind is blowing. All those little things become quite important. So I think I've I've chatted quite a bit on, you know, the scenario that's out there. Um, I've made a couple of notes. One is casting. Two is flyers. We'll talk about flyers. We, we'll talk about identifying the water and identifying the rises. Those are some of the crucial points which i've made so well yeah in a nutshell if i if i if i can before i there's a there is a member question but if, if before yeah. i ask that is uh so 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 for the sake of the theme of the of the of the of the session we're having tonight is so, so what makes yeah. late season and early season and good season what are the variables really that uh, that uh, a fly fisherman needs to take cognizance of yeah, it's a good question, Roy, because often people say, yeah, but what happens to the fish in the winter at Stirkfontein? And we'll talk Stirkfontein specifically here. Early season, you know, lots of people start going there in October. For me, the season realistically gets going middle of November, okay? But it can be very, very hit and miss because you've now got changeover from your sort of winter and you haven't quite got into spring yet. You can have big winds. And it's fine if you have flexibility and you can go down on short notice, but not everyone has that luxury. You know, so maybe you want to plan a little longer. You say, well, and it's always, it's, it's always an educated guess. You know, I mean, you're not going to hit the weather on the head every time a coconut. But if, so if you're looking for more consistent fishing, I would say, look at end of Feb, March. The weather's a little steadier. We, the rains have slowed down. This year was an exception to the rule. It's almost like we're back to days of old, a huge amount of rain, overcast weather makes fishing tough. 
but that's some, you know things move all the time and in a way i always say that's a good thing if it was the same all the time it would get really boring and you wouldn't get challenged and and i think that for me is a big part of fly fishing is a challenge all the time what are the fish doing what do i need to do i need to change i need to adapt and and sit back and observe you know um, ask the questions a lot of people are reluctant to ask questions like i said i mean for me i'm very lucky i get to fish with guys who are exceptionally uh, competent and i learn you learn all the time and i'm hoping vice versa you know so those are things and and you know the discussion i've had with some of my good mates this is stuff that there's no book written that i can go to and just and get it open it and info's there unfortunately it's not it's not always there and there's often a lot of conflicting information but the guys don't qualify why this explain to me why that happens and explain to me within reason for a lot of the time now we don't have all the answers but for a lot of the time we can say okay that's the scenario and that's why you're struggling because we the fish are eating size 18 20 22 24 26 30 type flies size the size of a pinhead and a five, six pound fish is coming up to sip that off the surface. And no, he's not going to eat a size eight or 10 hopper or beetle when he's doing that. He's very focused on what's going on and you're going to have to adapt or die. It's it's that simple, you know. But for me, I might not catch 15, 20 fish, but if I can catch one fish that I can cast to and watch him and I've worked out what fly and I've changed my leader and I've adjusted my tippet and fly size and I've fiddled around, um that's a really rewarding fish and i yes i'm spoiled i know i've been fishing for a long time and it comes when people fish differently um, and for different reasons and uh you know i always say there are not many advantages to getting old but hopefully you get a bit wiser as you get older so yeah i, I think i think you obviously said uh, i mean we all know fly fishing is a game of variables yeah many many variables but but let but let me let me let me ask you the let me let me point to you the uh, 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 give you the message from one of the members. It says hi Mark. It's, this comes from Anton Bakker. Okay. It's uh, hi Mark. Good to see you. Hope I'm not jumping the gun. Lately there has been reports of increased numbers of largies coming out of stackies. Are they concentrated at a particular area? Please discuss tactics. Cheers, Anton. Okay. Most of the lodges have been caught at Zippermouth Creek. No money kidding there. <laughs> it's very, it's very, it's very interesting in that some big lodges have been caught. Um, and I'm talking fish 15, 16 pounds, which are sort of we're talking fish eight kilos, anything between seven, eight, eight and a half. And I'm convinced that we'll see some fish nudging the nine kilo and some change mark. But to answer this the question specifically. Those fish are being caught very randomly in different spots um, and on crazy fly type size 10 beetles. The two big fish, one a client of mine caught and one uh, client of the, the fly castaway guys caught, were caught, both of them were caught on size 10 beetles. My fish was caught blind. They say they saw the fish uh, that they caught, the other big largey. You don't see a lot of largeys. I mean, I spend more time on the water there than i think most do and i'll be quite honest uh, you don't see lodges rolling uh, there are some areas and this season i promised myself that i would take out a big rod my eight or nine weight rod with an intermediate or sinking line and some streamer flies that we use for lodges on the vol and elsewhere it didn't happen okay what well, hasn't happened is yet I've told this batch of clients that are coming down on uh, Wednesday, Thursday, that if the small air fishing is tough, I plan to go in some areas where I expect to find fish to go and cast some bigger flies. And if we do have any success, I'll revert back and, and help. But lodges have a fondness for rocks and flow. Obviously, in Stokefontein, you don't get a lot of flow, but there's some areas with big submerged rocks that off the, I think Caddis Corner up near Dog's Head is one. That big fish came off very close to Quantani on the point where there, there's a whole lot of dead timber. And I know a lot of the largemouth bass fishermen when they're fishing what they call plastics or plastic worm type fishing, and they're fishing pretty four, five, sometimes six meters. Every now and again, they bump a big largey. So, and I know there are certain areas where I've caught them a little more consistently than others. 
but it, it's very haphazard, if the truth be known. Um, you know, they for some reason, they seem to move around a lot. I can tell you that from a couple of years observation now, February seems to be when most of the lodges come out. Why? I don't know. Um, I haven't been able to put my finger on it, but there's no doubt having chatted to a lot of the guides, that's when it happens. And the reason why you're not seeing um, maybe a lot of the pictures because we are concerned about anglers coming uh, and, and catching those lodges and keeping them, which is for me would be uh, a crime and, and very sad at the same time. So I'm hoping that answers your questions. If there's any anything else, just let me know. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, thanks, Mark, for that response. Um, there's, there's no other questions at the moment. Okay. Uh, so the, the the big thing, I think, maybe maybe seeing there's no questions, maybe we should talk about the the change environment. Um, from the launching at the government site versus Quantani, which I think it seems to me, uh, Dennis has probably lost that space. The, the, yeah. second, the second question is, 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 is I, I suppose Quantani is also strategically positioned and it's quite favorable. So how do you see, how do you see uh, the yellow fishing or yellow fly fishing or fly fishing for yellow is panning out in the future in terms of of guides and um, and fly fishermen like like ourselves look you know i think those that are familiar with the launch very close to dennis's home um i think most of you know that that we have lost the you know the use of that launch and i i was saying earlier i can't see that coming back as a launch site in the future. If it does, it'll be a bonus right now. That's not even a factor for us. So basically, the only other launches available are at Contani and at the government thing. Government uh, launch has been closed for a year. There was a rumor that it was going to open up. The rumor was out maybe a week, 10 days ago, that it was going to open up in a week or two. It turns out that's exactly what it was, a rumor. And it's closed until further notice. Who knows whether it'll be another year, two years. Unfortunately, no one can tell us anything. It hasn't been for lack of trying. So basically, you've now left with Quantani. And we've been fortunate as guides. The, the GM at Quantani has allowed us to launch and, and fish. But the general rule is, is that you're not allowed, as a, if you're not a, a resident in the, in the timeshare, you can't go and just launch your boat. So that's currently where we are, unfortunately. So it's it's a bit dire. Um, and and it, you're between a rock and a hard place because, as I say, if the government launched open up, it, it would be really good. It would be good for all of us. Right now, we don't have access to it. So I think that answers your question to a large extent. Right? Um, Quantani is nice. It's situated pretty much in the middle of the dam. If you go to the government launch, it's a long way up to the top of the dam. But there's a lot of fishing closer to the government areas, which guys don't always look at. And it's always the green grass on the other side. You know, you've always got to rush away from where you're launching. And I mean, Quantani has been a case in point this year. A lot of us have fished. Everyone comes out of the launch site at Quantani and hammers off to the right. We've had some really good fishing to the left. But that dam and the fish behavior change on a regular basis. So, you know, if you think you're going to go, oh, we caught fish there yesterday and rush off there the next morning. Yes, there are times that they're still there, but often they've moved. They've moved the goalposts and they're elsewhere. And that's where having a good understanding of the dam is really important. Um, where are you going to find some sheltered water? The wind is doing this. Do I know where to go to have a bit of protection from a big wind and things like that? But, and those take time. Those, those, those things, scenarios take time. You know, once you've spent time on the water, as I said, you get to know it. But, uh, yeah, and time's a valuable commodity. Not everyone has the time. And that's where it's good to go with a guide. If you've got a boat, he's going to show you pretty much in there, um, you know, where to go, what to do, give you some options. More importantly, he's going to point out some of the dangerous areas for, for you as a skipper. Um, you've got to be careful. Um, you might go over a rocky area and you need to 
keep that in mind. So those are some of the added benefits. The upside to stay contained generally, there are not many hidden obstacles. Um, but for those who know um, Stokefontein, the, the island that was on the eastern side, I think they call it, always get confused, I think they call it Darcy Island. But right now it's underwater because they've been putting a lot of water into Stokefontein Dam and the dam has risen from about 93 odd percent to must be close to 98 percent. I haven't checked on the actual, but that because of the amount of rain we had, there a lot of spare capacity down the water and most of you know I think that there's an hydro scheme so what keeps Stokefontein with water it, the amount of small streams that run in there supply a small fraction and almost insignificant amount of water to the dam the big uh, the big factor is the water they pump over from from down the mountain near on the old Bergville road so yeah I think that answers uh, most of those questions right yeah, just quickly, in, in terms of alternative accommodation, I think uh, Stoke Fontaine is, uh, um, uh, Quintana is going to get pretty busy by the, by the sounds of things, and, and you know, we desperately want to get on the water. What, what's the alternatives for, you know, for accommodation like uh, around, the, around the area? Well, look, there's obviously Dennis's, which a lot of you know from an accommodation point of view, it's still there. There are, there's very close to the entrance to the government, there's a guest house there called the River Runs something i can't remember exactly there's also windmill cottages that are very close to dennis's on the old burgle road it used to be the old caterpillar catfish but it's limited there's no doubt that it's limited there's a there's a fellow building some accommodation it's not going to be inexpensive accommodation it's going to be and i think it's going to be linked you know you can you can use my lawn site that's the wild horses lawn site but you need to be a resident in my accommodation, which is fair enough, but that's really what it boils down to. So there is some accommodation available, um, but it would be really nice if, if the government um, operation opened again, because you have the option, you have the camping caravanning option there. I haven't been in those chalets for a long, long time, but they tell me they are really dire at the moment and uh, not in great shape. Mark, just a question from one of the members on Lou. He says, um, are there any good reading material available um, about the dam for someone like me who is a complete newbie to the dam? Uh, Paul, it's an exceptionally good question because the truth is there's not a lot of good information out there. And the, the problem is, is that the information that there is sometimes dated and it's very conflicting because one fellow says this and another fellow says that, but very few people take the time to explain Okay, I'm suggesting this, and that's why I'm suggesting it, and it should make sense. Talk about water temperatures, talk about different times of the year. Those are some of the crucial components that, and sadly, there, there isn't um, a lot of that information around. Um, there is some good information, but I think one must always keep an open mind and don't accept that because you see it in print, that's the be all end all. Um, ask the questions. Most of the guides, a lot of people think that the guides aren't approachable. I can't speak for all the guides, but a lot of the guides I know will be quite happy to take a phone call and answer some questions uh, without too much of a problem. If, if, I, if I may add there, I think um, I, the, the member's question is very, very, very uh, valued. But I think I think I think the knowledge lies in the in the guides, and maybe maybe sometimes the guides should go and put down pen to paper. But besides that, I think, and I think we all, we've always said it that a guide is always worth uh, using. I see another. I see there's another question. Um, I, I come from Warwick. It says, "Hi, Mark. With regards to the super long leaders that are required a lot of times, would it be acceptable to use a five foot clear floating poly leader?" With additional eight to ten foot tippet. Um, again, it's a good question. What you've got to be careful of, and, and this happens a lot, is often if you use too long a tippet, because of the thin stuff, it doesn't have the ability to turn the fly over, and that's a problem. Um, what what I do leader-wise, some guys tie their own leaders, and they, there are various leader formulas which you can get onto um, on the internet. 
but I still buy a tapered leader. But what I do is I'll buy a tapered leader, a nine foot leader. Um, the, there are times when you can buy 12 footers, which would be recommended or even 15 foot leaders, uh, but they are scarce. Not everybody keeps it. So what I like doing is, I'll be quite honest, I couldn't tell you the diameter of a 3X, 4X or 5X tippet. You know, for me, it's very simple. I'll buy a leader that comes down to about a 12 pound point. And then onto that, diameter wise, I'll step it down to maybe a piece of eight pound maximum. And I keep the butt section. I don't want to, the reason why I buy the heavy leader, I want a thick butt section. Why? Because that turns, that aids you turning an 18, 20 foot leader over at the end of the day. Okay, and and again, it has a, it's a it's a turning your fly over has a lot to do with your leader makeup, obviously, and your casting technique. Okay, and and one of the problems is I see too many people forcing uh, their costs, thinking that the more effort you put in, the more you're going to get out of it. The irony of it is, you force the more you force it, the less you get out of it. I always tell people it's Irish: less is more. The technique is crucial. So getting back to your leader. I, I'm not convinced that that five foot uh, poly leader, I think you're better off buying a tapered leader. But in saying that, I would go out and test your theory and see whether it was work. And don't just test it with the wind. There are times you're going to have to cast that, that leader tip it into the wind. Okay. And that's where the true the casting uh, ability comes into that. And, you know, you know, as I say, turning the leader over. But I'm going to give you a helpful little hint. As a right-hander, if you're struggling to turn your longish leader over, and in my opinion, late season, you should be using a leader tippet length of minimum 15 foot. Better to be at about 17, 18. Yeah, I would say double rod length on a nine foot rod would be close. And if you can manage a bit more, the further you can get the fly line away from the fly, the better. That's really what it boils down to. But there's a little trick you can use when you're casting. As you're presenting the fly, and if you're struggling to turn your leader, pull pull your left hand back. So you, what effectively what you're doing, you're taking the slack out of the fly line and making sure you get a nice straight presentation. Hope that helps. Well, I, well, I must say, um, I, I think I think your advice is, is brilliant. But then, then, but then, in closing, it, I don't see any more questions, and so. It, um, so, in summary, Mark, what what is the tactics we, we need to we need to use for late season yellows? In, okay. summary, in summary, all right. So, I'm not saying for one second that the fish are not going to eat grasshoppers and beetles, all right. But if you're getting refuses and, and the fish are refusing your fly, you really need to change. And the general rule is, is if you're getting refusals, change come down in the diameter of the, the nylon. So you, your, your tippet, you need to get it right down and scale the size of your fly down. Those are the two golden rules, okay? And I'm also gonna to talk to you a little bit on that. So those, as it, that's what happens because the fish feed very differently. The fish start eating what we call buzzers or coronamids or midges. It's very confusing because the English call them buzzers and Americans call them midges or coronamids. So you need to have flies in your arsenal. You need to have small clink cameras. Black predominantly has been very kind to us. When I say small, 16s, 18s. Be careful of very bright posts. The fish don't like those posts. I normally get hold of the guy's flies and I cut the post flush. Interestingly enough, you can see black. It stands out on the water and the fish. This year, black was very good to us. Things, standard things like elk wing caddis. I've made a little note here. But you need to have a variety of sizes. And the back end of the season, you need to err on smaller flies. And when I say smaller flies, I'm talking 14s, 16s, 18s. Normally, that will cover all your, your options. Small little ants, you know, you, you need to be prepared. You need to have a, a good flying ant imitation, the big one that most of us are familiar with. But then you're going to need some smaller ants. And these are not always easy to tie. And my strong advice is, Go to one of the custom tires. It's the best investment you'll ever make is having, I'd rather have 40 good flies than 400 average arbitrary flies. And the vast majority of our commercially available flies 
leave much to be desired. And that's, um, that's the polite description. Guys like Sun Living Fly, I know Arno Lopeshek quite well. He happened to be a partner of mine in the business. He runs a factory and he, there are some nice flies available from there. Um, and I'm happy to send something to Roy, but I think I've mentioned things like Griffith's Net, very underrated fly, um, but get it small. You want it in about a 16, 18. That's what those fish are eating. But it's really important that you get your fly out there um, with a straight leader. Have we found fish? Are there some rise forms? What are the fish doing? Look at the rise form. If there's no, if there's no telltale bubble when you see him head and tailing, he's eating something in the surface form. So it's it's Griffith's nap time or um, your your clink hammer type flies. If he's eating something on the surface, what have I seen? Have I seen ants? Have I seen some mayflies? So don't make it too complex. Keep it, try and keep it simple, but make sure you've got a variety of different flies in, in, in your box. Sure, have the beetles and the hoppers, but you need to have some other smaller flies there too. And I mean sort of 16s, 18s. And don't be intimidated. Um, they need to be tied on a decent wire hook. A lot of these small flies sometimes are tied on two things, either, either too heavy a wire, which is going to make the fly sink, or too light a wire. So you, you now tighten up on a fish that you've been chasing for hours, and, and he just straightens the hook. So those are little subtle things that, that you need to take care of. Uh, Mark, thanks a lot. So, so, so on, on a lighter note, the doctor's beetle is still works a bit. <laughs> it, look, it's it's quite interesting, Roy. I mean, this year, you know, it's, the, um, you know, despite the the beetles are dead, it's turpentine. And I mean, I spoke to the castaway guys, and they said if it wasn't for the purple beetle, yes. um, they caught fish hand over fist. And you know, the interesting thing is, if someone said to me, "Okay, Mark, this for me is the real test. You've got one fly to fish a whole season with at turpentine." Now, tell me what it is. Give me a size 10 purple beetle any day of the week. That would be my call, my personal call. Yeah. So, yes, you are getting more refusals on, on, on beetles and hoppers. And, you know, this debate about uh, fluorocarbon and versus normal nylon. I think most South Africans, the ego is quite a brittle thing. And the vast majority of refusals are different time. It's because of the wrong product as opposed to the nylon. So what I'm saying is they're refusing the fly, not because it's not tied on fluorocarbon or anything else. It's the wrong product. And I always say to the corporate guys, I said, you want to think along these lines. Picture the fish as being the client. Picture your fly as being the product. And you are pitching your product to the client. And if the client doesn't buy in after four hours, you've got to change your pitch and you've got to change your product because he doesn't like what you're throwing at him. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Mark, for that. Uh, Mark, there's two questions. Uh, the first one from Frick van Staren. He says, what's the best method to fix the fly to the tippet? I hope I understand that question, but do you understand? Yeah. Okay. I do understand it, yeah. Okay. okay. Okay, for me, one of the knots I use a lot, and I, I want to say something quickly about knots. And human nature is a strange beast because everyone you talk to Try this knot, try that knot. And people end up more confused than ever before about knots, okay? My advice is very simple. You need to know maybe three or four knots that don't let you down. Stick to those. But to answer your question, I'm very fond of what we call the, the non-slip monoloop, lefty craze non-slip monoloop, or the Rapala knot. And the reason why I like it, once you've practiced it, you can – you can leave a loop in front of the fly. So basically the nylon is not dictating the movement of your fly because as soon as you pull up a nylon onto a small fly, often the nylon dictates the movement. And there's another reason. Sometimes big fish are eating small flies, okay? And people are struggling to land those fish on 5X or 6X. With that loop knot, you can actually, because you're not pulling the nylon, you pull the 4X onto a size 16, 18, and I mean, it's just a disaster. There's no movement there. But with that loop knot, you can get away with a heavier tippet than the fly would dictate. I mean, just to quickly say to you, there's the rule of three. So you take the size of the fly, roughly divided by three, that'll give you an indication of the tippet, the tippet 
that you should be using. And I stress it's an indication. It's not a hard and fast rule. So, for example, if a size 18, you should be using a 6X. Okay, and people are terrified about 6X. I challenge them to put a 6X tippet or a 5X tippet on the end of the line and get someone to hold the fly line and the leader at a, at a distance. And I want you to pull on the rod, not a sudden snap, just pull. And you'll be astounded at how much you can actually pull. What breaks the nylon is that sudden shock. The fish is running, the rod's straight, and there's a slight bumpy in the reel or someone palms the, the reel, and it's going to break that 5X, 6X in the blink of an eye. Um, so it takes it takes a bit of getting used to light to But my, my advice is try it. As I said earlier, if the fishing gets tough, the general rule is scale, scale the diameter of the nylon down, scale the size of the fly down. Don't be shy to go to a 16, 18. The other thing is if you've been fishing a big fly, a beetle or a hopper in a size 10 or 12 for four hours, you have nothing to lose. Absolutely nothing to lose by throwing out a small fly. Clearly nothing's happened on a big fly. And, you know, three or four of you are fishing the same old techniques, same fly, change. Do something a little different. As I said, we've been at it three, four hours. The client doesn't like the product we've been pitching at them. Change, change the product. You've got nothing to lose. Scale the size of the fly down and scale the diameter of the nylon. Down. So I like uh, I like that non-slip mono loop with a practice. With a bit of practice, you can get the loop very close to the eye of the fly. You want to make sure it's not too big because those those fish are going to scrutinize your fly, and and they are going to come up with within millimeters of your fly and look at your fly carefully. But you need to uh, you need to identify that and say, okay, the fish has refused my fly. And after three or four refusals, you should change. Uh, but you also need to make sure you're looking to see. Not everyone sees those refusals and automatically puts it down to the nylon. It's not the nylon. I've just said at times, and you've got to be qualified very carefully. Guys have caught, um, I'm going to try and find a picture for Roy of, of a big uh, of a big cricket type thing. That this friend of mine, Anton, fished on 12 pound maximum. And the reason why he's fishing 12 pound maximum because the fish were taking him into the trees and breaking him off. And he'd had about enough, but he didn't have any 10 or 8 pound maximum with him. Um, he was fishing on the dam a couple of days ago using 6 pound maximum. But there was a chop on the water. You're talking about feeding fish, and it's a, it's a different scenario. So one needs to qualify very carefully why this and why that. But to answer your question quick, small that, that, Rapala knot or the non-slip mono loop is, is my go-to knot. It hasn't let me down. If you tie good knots, it shouldn't let you down. Um, so yeah, I don't like that uni knot that slips up because no matter how carefully you tie it, it often leaves a kink in your, your tippet, which is a problem. Where if you with a bit, with a bit of practice with that non-slip mono loop, you can get a small loop and um, it's pretty strong and it's the knot I use and it hasn't let me down. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. I think, Mark, that, that was well, ex well explained, and thank you very much for that. And I'm sure Frank uh, appreciates that. The next question is, do you, somebody's got the, let me just see who's got the mute on, uh, not uh, audio on, okay. So the next question is, do you treat your leader to sink it? It's a really good question, and this debate has raged on for a long, long time. And my my sound advice now is I used to be stubborn and say it doesn't make any difference. It does make a difference. And you should be treating your tippet specifically to try and ideally sink below the surface. That's, that's first price. You can use mud or something like that. And I'm not convinced, and uh, neither are a lot of guys, that fluorocarbon is going to sink and, and make a difference in that department. For me, 300 rand for 30 meters of fluorocarbon is iniquitous. Three spools of that or four spools, you bought yourself a good fly line. So, yes, I would say without a doubt, especially when, it, when the water is calm um, and the fish are being particularly finickety. And I think this is where, you know, because we spend so much time on the water and we get to see different scenarios and fish behaving very differently, that's where I would say yes, without a doubt. Given the option, I'd rather have a sinking tippet. It's not a big deal when it's rough and there's a lot of chop on the water. It, they, they, they're going to scrutinize your fly so much less. But, yep, without a doubt, a sunken tippet is first price. Well, Mark, uh, thanks for that. Be really appreciate that. Um, 
<clears throat> Mark, there, there being no, and members, there being no further questions, um, I, I, I would, I think we should close the evening. I think it was a very informative. It's always a, a, a warm and welcome to have Mark with his knowledge. I'm sure we can have uh, Mark press on your button again going forward. Um, but, but once again, thank you very, very much. Um, um, and, and and if the guys want to guys want to use you, Mark, I mean, obviously they're welcome. Um, yeah, we just just got to sort out, um, you know, the the accommodation at Quantani, which is a which, which is a problem. Uh, or, or, or with good planning, it, it will work very well. But but Mark, but Mark, may I say say thank you to you on behalf of the of the committee and the members. Very informative as always. Always learn from a from a master a legend like yourself. And thank you very much for entertaining us this evening. It's a pleasure, Roy. Um, and yeah, we're planning. As I said, you and I had a chat. If we uh, plan down the road, uh, book some accommodation. My plan is also to do a seminar at Sturkfontein, um, yeah. possibly two, one towards the end of the year and one in sort of February, March next year. When I have those dates, I'll forward them to you so Please you do. can pass them on. Please do. But always a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you to you. And and, and Mark, we'll, we'll, we will use this recording. This recording will go to YouTube uh, as, as with your permission, uh, like you gave us prior to, to opening the session. Uh, so, of course, members can view it again. But thank, thanks once again. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Mark. Thank you to the members. Much appreciated. Thanks, Good evening. Thanks, Roy. Yeah, pleasure. Go well, everybody. Thank you. Yeah. All the best.